Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it, and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website in enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. With great pleasure, I'd like to welcome Howard Ruff to the show. He is a very well-known author. His most recent book is How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century, and that was published in 2008. Howard, it's great to be talking with you personally. Well, great to talk to you. I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> me me too. So tell us about your take on the current economy. I mean, it's pretty pretty disgusting what's going on out there with the, the money printing and the bailouts and rewarding the wrong behaviors and the moral hazards and so on and so forth. What is your take on stuff? Well, you got it all just right. My take on it is that, and it's the conclusion I've drawn, and that I'm uh, and I'm viewing with alarm, like I've never done in my entire career. The problems that we face are uh, amount to socialism. We used to be creeping towards socialism. Now we're galloping towards socialism. And uh, I I see uh, uh, Barack Obama. I hesitate to say this, but if he isn't the Antichrist, he'll do until one comes along. He is definitely moving us toward a very big government. A lot of draconian rules, and well, not just that. Uh, the thing to remember about it is the definition of socialism. Socialism is government owning or controlling the means of production. All socialist economies do it. That's the definition of the term. Sure. And and now he's taken over the automobile industry, he's taken over Wall Street, and he's taken over the insurance industry. And what he's done is uh, given them money with strings attached. He claims he's not going to make decisions for them. That's a bunch of baloney. What he's doing, he's already at uh, General Motors. He's already fired the CEO at, at AIG Insurance Company. He's all said, "Well, we can't pay those guys bonuses, even though they're working for a dollar a year plus bonuses, and we're the best producers they had." Uh, and and he's uh, step by step taking total control. And I was interested that uh, Barney Frank, Congressman in the House, said that uh, uh, he thought we could control the, the salaries and payout and bonuses of companies, even that hadn't received money from. And that just scares the wits out of me. I mean, that, that is very scary. Yeah, the yeah, strings really attached to, to money, and government has big strings attached to all this money. But remember what Rahm Emanuel said when he became uh, chief of staff of the White House. He said, "You can't allow a crisis to be wasted." Yep, and let's never miss the opportunity to use this crisis to, you know, promote our agenda. For example, they when they did that uh, seven hundred some odd thousand. Uh, our, Seven hundred some odd billion bailout package. Uh, it was. It had like forty years of the uh, of what the liberals in Congress wa- had wanted for forty years, and nobody got a chance to read it before they voted on. They finished about eleven o'clock at night. The night before they had to vote, no one, not one person who voted for it, had read it before. Not one. You know what's interesting about that is that I, I remember Obama during the campaign promising that he would put everything up on a website for five days so the American people could review stuff before votes were cast so they'd have time to react and, you know, write to their representative and so forth. And these kind of things were just rushed through. But, you know, Bush is not free of blame either. I mean, Bush and Paulson, you know, between the two of those guys, uh, I mean, they were a little less socialist, but it started to get pretty big in terms of the size of the government under Bush, too. Well, the, uh, what we have to remember is that uh, much of this has been approved by uh, Democrats who initiated a lot of the stuff, but backed up by weak-kneed Republicans right. who uh, who were just basically enablers. So, you know, years ago, remember when, uh, when Papa Bush said that, uh, read my lips, no new taxes? Mm-hmm. He said that to me on my TV show. Mm-hmm. 
I'm the guy he said it to. Wow. When he did, I decided to abandon the Republican Party. I'm uh, much more in tune with the philosophy they profess, but I'm not in tune with the way they practice it. And consequently, uh, I resigned noisily from that party and publicly, and uh, so I don't know what I am. I'm not a libertarian because I don't like their philosophies. I'm certainly not a liberal. I'm more in tune with the, with the state of Republican philosophy, but they don't do what they say they're going to do. They just don't. Well, when you say, you know, I mean, Bush got really, you know, he got really vilified for the read my lips no new taxes thing when he ran the second time but i am talking bush senior of course it wasn't really he who who promoted more taxes he just caved in he, he didn't stand up to the uh the big government liberals right well actually he, he uh endorsed it oh he did okay well it oh, yeah, must have been yeah, a trade-off yeah, a plea bargain it. then i, I don't yeah, remember he actually that. endorsed it. Yeah. And that's why I resigned. I didn't want anything more to do with a party that would do that. Yeah. Well, you know, tell us your philosophy on why controlling the means of production and increasing. I mean, to me, taxes are just a contemporary version of slavery. And the government has to tax a little bit so you don't have anarchy. But it's been blown so far out of proportion with what's going on nowadays. You know, give us sort of your philosophical underpinning for that, if you would. And then let's take this into how one reacts to this, how one invests, how one protects themselves. You mean the uh, defending the definition that I gave you? Yeah. I don't have to defend the definition. They, I, every economist, they, they go down to the brass roots, they'll all agree with that. That's the definition, the actual true definition of socialism. And every, uh, every socialist country, and there have been a lot of them, the Soviet Union was socialist, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, the Nazis was who, but the, Na the National Socialist Party, Britain's socialism, uh, all of these things. Our government eventually getting control of the industry now that this, the Obama administ administration has taken control of the automobile industry. They've taken control pretty much of the insurance industry. They've certainly taken control of Wall Street, and I don't see that as anything but the purest definition of socialism. The only hang-up is that they find that they have to control people's behavior, and so all socialisms eventually turn into totalitarian systems. A totalitarian elite that tells you what to do. That's the link I'm looking for, actually. I, I didn't mean for you to go into that much detail on it, but, but what does this really mean to people? Because nowadays, this is all being soft-pedaled as though, you know, maybe the government can run it better. These are crazy statements to Praise me. But... God, when has government ever run anything well, except maybe the wars? And, and that would be debatable, too. Yeah, well, uh, let me tell you this. Um, the one thing that happens under socialism is they throw a lot of money around. In fact, today, uh, government knows they've got a recession. They know they have a deflationary period. They don't know anything to do with that except throw money at it. Well, in the process of throwing money at deflation and recession, they're laying the foundation for inflation coming around the corner. And so we're just a few months away from all of this money they're printing turning into inflation. Inflation is at all times and all places a monetary phenomenon. Now when inflation picks up, IQ can bet that this administration will go to price and wage control. That always creates shortages. I remember when my wife and I were on a cruise and we stopped at Leningrad in the Baltic and we were on a bus and all of a sudden when the bus got stopped in traffic, we saw all kinds of people running and we don't know where they were and I found out someone on our bus spoke Russian and found they were running for a store because the rumor was out that something that was for sale there that had been scarce. They didn't know what it was. They just wanted some because the shortages were, that were created by wage and price controls were immense. They were tremendous. I remember one time I was in Moscow and I was with a tour guide on a bus tour in Moscow, Russia. And, you know, I always, whenever I go to these formerly communist countries, I always ask a lot of questions about it. And she was telling about how they had to wait in line for shoes. One time she waited in line for shoes for 16 hours. And it's cold in Moscow, too, in the winter. And it was very cold out, and people were just lined up to get shoes. And by the time they got in to get their shoes... They didn't even have her size, so you just took whatever you could get, and you figured you'd trade it later. I mean, what a ridiculous loss of human productivity, and it's just so inane how people think these systems actually work. That always happens under socialism. Yeah. They all turn to some kind of totalitarian government, fascism, Nazism, Soviet Union. They all have to do that, so we find our lives being run by an elite that controls everything for everybody else. And it sure seems like this elite is pretty far from the American people. They're, they're paying people out. I mean, Obama, when he did the auto deal, and he just sort of, 
you know, abandon the bondholders, the people who created the capital for the company in favor of the UAW, it, it just reminds me of that George Bernard Shaw statement, Howard, that says a government that robs Peter to pay Paul can always depend on the support of Paul. So they're just buying votes. Well, the thing that's uh, amazing is that uh, bailout of General Motors started with George Bush. Yeah. The political pressures to turn socialist are irresistible because it, it, all, it always promises a lot of things, promises a lot of things. And right now, half of the people in America uh, don't pay any taxes, so there's no constituency for, uh, for controlling taxes. Half of the people in America get a check from some level of government. So there's no constituency for uh, for cutting uh, government spending. Uh, and the, there was a poll recently that found that half of the people in America were confused over what might be better, socialism or capitalism. And they didn't have the slightest idea what either one was. And I don't think Barack Obama knows that. All he knows is that there are promises. The people who've been getting checks from the level of government, especially young people, they've always gotten checks. They got checks from their parents. They got student loans. Uh, they just have great expectations and promises. So based on promises, countries turn to socialism. They always do. And the inflation that we're looking at, uh, is, which is basically a collapse of the value of, of a currency, every currency lasts maybe 75, 80 years. That's the lifespan. That's how long they last. Uh, ours have been around for 80 years right now. And so inflation is not rising prices any more than wet sidewalks or falling rain. Inflation is simply the, the dilution of the of the capital by making more of it, decreasing its value by making it common. That inflation eventually reflects itself in higher prices because inflation to an economist is not rising prices. Inflation to an honest economist is in the diminishing of the value of currency by creating more of it. Consequently, all this money that's being thrown around right now, these trillions of dollars, and I've been, in all the years of publishing, I've never uh, used the word trillions before. I just didn't think it was possible. But all these trillions that are throwing around are going to create a massive inflation that I predict is going to start for the end of this year, and uh, Barack Obama is going to paint himself into a corner with it. And so uh, right now he's fighting deflation and recession. One of these days he's going to be fighting runaway inflation. I bet you anything with their mentality that they'll turn to wage and price controls and create shortages. And that will be followed by uh, people taking over everybody's lives. The whole idea is we're on the cusp of socialism. We really, truly are. And the average person doesn't have the slightest idea what it is, the slightest idea what causes it. And so the, a small minority are, are going to make money. You know, we're, I'm a maverick. Maverick is a cow that's left the herd. Well, the, the herd is still in Wall Street. They're doing what their financial advisor tells them to do. And that, that herd is going to all be turned into hamburger. And a small minority are going to make a lot of money out of the mainstream, not doing what Wall Street says, but doing what they know will make them money, what they finally become convinced will make them money. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Well, good for you. Hey, you're, that makes you a real smart guy. When you, when you talk about most of that herd being made hamburgers, and then you talk about the shortages that will will eventually follow the inflation when you have price controls, it actually just happened in Zimbabwe, you know, which is sort of the poster child for inflation. Their currency's worth the paper it's printed on, basically, which is what all fiat currencies become, paper and ink value. They instituted price controls, and they said that the shopkeepers would be arrested if they raised prices anymore. And so guess what happened, Howard? What a, what a surprise. Shortages. Goods disappeared. The shopkeepers just said, I quit. I'm not going to do it anymore. Why am I going to run a shop if I if I'm I, I have to pay a certain price for goods and I can't resell it and make a profit? I'm out of business. So then there's uh, then there's just price controls and then there's just shortages and it becomes this unproductive, deadly spiral into socialism and central planning. Let me talk to you a little bit about gold, if I could, and debt. I had Pat Buchanan on the show and I couldn't have quoted him better. Then when he said this, after I explained our strategy, and by the way, since we've only talked for just maybe two or three minutes before we started recording, and I've never talked to you before, I want to explain our investment philosophy a little bit and see what you think of it, because I'll, I'll be very interested. We believe in investing in little inexpensive rental properties, where basically the land is free, and you're basically buying the commodities, the construction materials the copper wire, the petroleum products, the glass, the steel, the lumber, the concrete, the energy that it takes to assemble, you know, a little inexpensive, modest rental house, okay? In areas where land is either free or cheap, and we're buying them far below actual construction costs nowadays. And then we believe 
it, so there's the commodities investment, what I call packaged commodities investing. And then we believe that you should use as much long-term fixed debt as possible, so long as the property is self-sustainable and there's positive cash flow, because you get three-decade debt at artificially low interest rates. And you know, I'm sure you think rates are going up. I sure do. And, and, and Pat Buchanan said, you know, Jason, that's a pretty good strategy, because basically their debt will be floated away on a sea of inflation. And I thought, you know, I couldn't have said that better myself. It was uh, very quotable. What do you think about that idea? Well, it's okay, except timing is the problem. Right now, I, when I wrote the How to Prosper in the Giving Bad Years back in 1978, I recommended real estate as an inflation head. So why aren't I recommending that now? Because real estate, residential real estate, is still in free fall and hasn't bottomed out yet. Well, as a, as a financial advisor, you know, I want to buy low and sell high. But doesn't that depend on what market you're talking about? I mean, you know, certainly in a it's country... It's virtually universal. I would like, yeah, you can pick up markets yeah. where that's not happening, but it's, it, it's just about universal. And I think the uh, the upshot of it all is that infl- the residential real estate will become a good inflation hedge and your strategy will work. But right now, you're it's, uh, trying to buy a res- a real estate now because people think it's near a bottom. It's sort of like trying to catch a falling safe. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think in markets that are the, bu- you know, the bubble markets where you're paying for a lot of land value in that equation, like you know anything in California, most of Florida, the Northeast, the expensive markets, None of those make any sense. But if you look at like Texas last year, you know, the three top appreciating, I did say appreciating, by the way, markets in the U.S. were in Texas doing about 4% annually, which you combine that with leverage and free land and buying below construction costs. That to me seems like a pretty good equation. And I know you're a gold bug, so I want to talk about gold and metals in a moment. I'm not a gold bug. Let me, oh, let okay. me put the, right. the quietest to that. Okay, go. Uh, first of all, I had some, I was on a talk show recently and someone said, well, I know you always buy gold. No, that's not true. I've been publishing for 34 years. I've been bullish on gold and silver for 12 of those years. My job as a financial advisor is just to be right for the time. Sure. And different things at different times. Sometimes I'm bullish on the stock market, not bonds, especially. Sometimes I'm not, and I'm bullish on the precious metals. Right now, we've gotten into a, into a situation where the fundamentals say, well, Rogers was right. Invest in inflation is the only thing that's going up. <laughs> that's a good quote. And I think that uh, I became bullish on the metals again in like 2003. That was good after, timing. After about uh, 15, 12, 15 years of being bearish on it. Mm-hmm. My job is to make money for my subscribers. And the, 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 uh, it's all flows around again. Let me give you another quote. Yogi Berra, he said, it's deja vu all over again. I love Yogi Berra. He, he cracks me up with his quotes. They're, they're so funny. But uh, yeah, it is deja vu all over again, isn't it? It is. And what's and I burst from the scene in nine, in the mid seventies, and that was my recommendation was gold and silver because it was right for those times. And we made a lot of money in gold and silver. Like when I started recommending gold in seventy five, it was one hundred and five dollars an ounce. The silver was under two dollars. Gold eventually peaked out at uh, at eight fifty, and silver at uh, fifty. So the uh, the point is, I made people a lot of money, and everybody figures out I'm stuck. In the past, I'm still bullish on gold and silver. That's baloney. I'm bullish when the time is right. The time happens to be right for now. Yeah, and I would agree with you. The only reason I'm not such a gold bug, and I hate to use that term, but I just said it, so I'll just stick with it, is that gold and silver are definitely better than fake money, dollars, currency, because they are real money, okay? But they they have a few flaws. You know, they don't produce income. There's no financing available, no tax benefits, no one will rent them from you. And m- most of all, and you know, I'm sure you can speak to these two quite well, is that they're subject to confiscation, possibly. You know, it happened in the 30s. And also subject to manipulation because the central banks want to see gold pushed down. They want to see silver and gold constantly manipulated and pushed down because they're in the business of fiat currencies. And, uh, you know, what, what do you think about those, those five characteristics that they don't make them as, as, as pleasing to me? Although- well, all those characteristics are avoidable if you choose wisely, and that's what I, I advise my subscribers to do. I show them how to invest in it. For example, I can give you some other things that are fraudulent about it. When gold is taken off, the Sharpies come out, assuming that it's a big emotional moment, and they can get people to go for their frauds. And there are all kinds of frauds, like, don't have to take the metal home, we'll store it for you. Well, you don't know whether they're actually storing it, and right. a lot of companies are, are not doing it. They're cheating, yep. and there's uh, there are all kinds of problems, but they're all avoidable. And so I have four, four recommended dealers that deal nationally, 
Not because they're the only good ones, because I'm getting old, more than four is too many to, to monitor. But uh, the, the point is that uh, uh, you want me to go down the list of things that are wrong with all, with Wall Street's investment, with stocks and bonds? Please do. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot wrong with them, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Go, go right ahead, please. Well, first, uh, the, Wall Street has paid lots of money for selling pieces of paper that supposedly represent something tangible, supposedly. Right. They're immensely money motivated. I remember when I was at my the peak of my notoriety in the 75 or in, this, or in the late 70s, I got a call from Merrill Lynch, the chairman of the board, to come to New York and they paid my trip and they showed me around. They were thinking about a mutual fund they thought I might like with the precious metal. Well, so I went there and uh, they had a vice president chair t- taking me around. He took me into the uh, in this huge room with, with all kinds of desks and everybody's talking on phones at desks. And these were the brokers. Well, all they were talking about was the money they made, commission. So he, the guy took me out to the garage and showed me all the Porsches and Maseratis and Cadillacs, and I was supposed to be impressed. Then he took me on the roof, showed me the yacht harbor in the Hudson River, just loaded with yachts and told about how the brokers all own these yachts. I was supposed to be impressed with that. I was not. I've never met such a greedy, uh, money-motivated group of people in my life, and that very fact turned me off. So the point is, the money in the future is going to be made by people who ignore Wall Street. We don't pay any attention. Like I said, the herd is going to turn to hamburger. Howard, I'm, I'm surprised. I thought you were going to say is the punchline to that story. You asked them, where are the customers' yachts? <laughs> because... Yeah, well, that, that was, uh, there was a book by that. Yeah, time. right. But uh, that was, those are all the broker's yachts. Sure. And a lot of these guys are taking make millions of dollars a year in commission. I know. Now, the, uh, the gold and silver is not hard. It's just unfamiliar to most people. It's not hard to buy. And, uh, and I'm just uh, dictating a chapter now for my new book, which describes the problems and how to avoid them. It's, it's, I'm not a gold bug. Gold bugs are always bullish on gold and silver. That's not me. Okay. I just want to be right for the time. Yeah, fair enough. What do you think about the numismatic side of precious metals? Well, you to, you've got to know a lot more about than I want to, want to know because uh, there's, you've introduced a couple other factors. One is the bullion content. Another is the scarcity and condition of the coins. And I'm, I don't have the skill to judge that. So uh, you, you will make money in numismatics, but it requires skills that I don't have. You will do well, but... I kind of like the semi numismatics, which are uh, have some scarcity value, and but, and their value is pretty much based on the bullion value and a little bit for the scarcity value. I like those things because they're specifically exempted from uh, seizure if the government should decide to seize gold. Uh, assuming the law stays the same, though, too, right? I mean, they can they can always change the law, right? Yeah, but they have no reason to do that right now. The government uh, thinks gold is uh, something that they manufacture and sell coins. They're trying to sell this stuff. They're not going to buy it. And remember, when Roosevelt did it, it was considered real money, and he did it to improve the government's balance sheet. They seized the gold. It wouldn't improve the government's balance sheet because it isn't even on the balance sheet. But just in case you're worried about it, that's one of the reasons why we'd prefer silver, because the silver market is so small, government wouldn't benefit by seizing the silver. They, they would hardly benefit. The odds are the government... Won't even pay any attention to silver. And to them, it's just an industrial metal. And But yet, throughout history, it's been a monetary metal. It's been more useful for making it a currency than gold has over the years. So I like it. And uh, there are over 2,000 industrial uses of it, so it's good to do well in good times or bad. And incidentally, the uh, as I've been watching uh, the gold and silver markets, which I do every day, uh, they've been doing very, very well. For example, when the market collapsed back in 2008 and the stock market was down like 45, 55, 65 percent, gold was down only 7 percent for a little while. Silver took a beating and I begged my subscribers to jump in and buy some. When it drove it clear down from like, like 18 down to uh, 9, I recommend that they they buy it. Now, you'll never find an opportunity like this. It's back up now over 15 on mm-hmm. its way back up. Right. The point is this. Uh, I'm not a trader. I don't believe in trading uh, anything because I'm no good at it. I always buy high and sell low when I trade, but I don't recommend my subscribers. I don't have the skills to do that. So I want to catch a trend early in the trend, buy it and hang on no matter what, all through the ups and downs. That's what we've got right now. Do you think that one day in the future here, as inflation sets in and the dollar becomes progressively more and more worthless, do you think that we'll actually be trading, you know, silver coins to buy things? Or do you think we'll be trading our our silver and gold for other fiat, uh, new fiat currency, uh, 
you know, what are your thoughts about like the Amero? Is that a crazy conspiracy that's theory? My, that's above my pay grade. I'm okay. sorry, I don't know the answer yeah, to that okay. question. All right. I should. I don't care. Yeah. Right now, we'll simply be on the right side of it if we own some. That's all I'm pretty sure of. It. Yeah, okay. All right. So when you talk about how inflation can make people rich, is that the way being invested in, in the bullions and, you know, having gold and silver as it rises in value? Well, that's one way. Um, another, there's another thing that's going to happen. As the price of oil goes back up over $100 a, a barrel, and it will, all of a sudden we'll find uh, that stores are having trouble getting truckers to get their back door and restock their shelves because they can't afford the fuel. Consequently, I recommend my subscribers that they, when they go to the store to buy any commodity, not just food, that, you know, diapers, soap, motor oil, whatever, that they don't just buy one, they don't buy one can of tuna, buy a case, they decide, and that way you'll be buying at today's low prices and consuming at tomorrow's higher prices. So that's a way to get a return on investment instead of on inflation, on the right side of it. I also, as the price of fuel goes up, uh, eventually public pressure will lead to a release of the uh, of the oil service companies to build more oil oil uh, wells and service them uh, offshore. So I like oil service companies, and I think they're going to benefit from inflation. Also, the pressure is going to build and build it to uh, construct more nuclear plants. Right now, there are 35 under construction or on the drawing board. There's going to be more, and even if they only build that 35, there's still, there's only half enough uranium above ground to service their needs. So I like uranium stock. That's another way to better inflation. Uranium mining companies. So I like that. I'm not down on the whole stock market, just the growth stocks, the Dow Jones. It's not like I'm down on most of it. But there are places and industry groups that I like that could make a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and I agree with you about those sectors being wise investments, uh, given that situation. But there's always the potential graft of the the investment banks, the CEOs, the boards of directors, and, you know, they, they just skim the money off the top and the profits. So even if the sector can, does well, maybe the investors still don't fare well, right? Well, so perhaps, but we don't know all that will happen. We won't even know what's happening. Consequently, I, I would like to base my investment program on actually owning the bullion and a, a good selection of mining stocks and mutual funds that invest in mining stocks. I like those areas. And you will make a great deal of money. And someday, we don't know whether we'll have a new currency that's backed by the commodities or whether we'll uh, someday be by using our coins to buy stuff. I have no idea how it's going to turn out. And, and I'm somebody smarter than me might figure that out. In the long run, we'll be glad we have it because whatever happens to it, it will be useful. And it's the simplest to buy. They're the least factors to worry about, the least complications. And so, they, for example, there's a Probably a coin dealer within a mile of your house. One of the dealers you recommend, actually, is right here in Orange County. Yeah, and uh, and they're very inexpensive. But, oh boy, be careful. Compare Even if you buy from one of the companies I recommend, compare prices, because prices can differ. They differ wildly. They do, and from day to day, and from even from hour to hour. Yeah. No. So always compare prices. No, no question about it. And I have found that some of these that have their own radio shows and stuff, those guys are some of the most expensive of all. I've heard them on, you know, AM radio and called up and priced them against another dealer. And I couldn't believe the price difference. It was just an, an amazing how much more they charged. Do, do you think, Howard, there's any risk of getting like a fake metal? You know, that's always sort of concerned me. You know, you take delivery of some gold coins and, you know, or some uh, gold, uh, one ounce gold bar or something. How do you know it's real? You know, maybe it's fake. I mean, it looks pretty, but who does anybody test it or anything? You know, do any buyers do that? That's another reason I like silver. There's not enough money in a given quantity of silver, a silver coin, or even a hundred ounce silver bar to make it worthwhile to spend all the time in trouble coming up with counterfeit. There will be some counterfeiting in gold. There always is. That's one reason why I have recommended companies. I know they check them. I know they check everything they have to make sure it's real. Well, I trust them. I don't always trust them to have the best prices at any given time, but I trust the integrity of their of their business. Good. And what do you think about other commodities? You mentioned uranium and so forth, but you know, what do you think about soybeans and coffee and rice and, you know, all the other things out there? The only way you can buy them is buy a futures contract and have a truck dump a, t a couple of tons of it on your front porch. <laughs> yeah. The average person can't do that. Right. The reason I like gold and silver is the one commodity that people can buy in concentrated small amounts, take home and conceal around their house. Mm -hmm. That's vastly superior to the other thing. Yes, I think commodities are going to go up, but the average person doesn't have the, uh, cannot invest them short of having a warehouse. 
with storage of these metals, do you think it's wise to have it in your house or should it be in a safe deposit box? And, you know, I'll tell you the reason I ask that is that my grandfather collected a lot of coins and so forth. And, you know, he used to show them to some people and he, uh, he suffered a home invasion robbery. They stole a lot. Uh, fortunately, no one was hurt, but uh, it wasn't a pleasant experience to go through. You know, do you think it's okay to keep it in a safe deposit box? What are the alternatives? Safe deposit box, the government has the right, right. to tell the banks to seize the safe deposit boxes. And there already are laws that prevent you from storing precious metals or currency or explosives in there. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah there are laws right now. Wow. And so there's nothing perfectly safe. I remember a company, Investment Rarities, I recommend, they had developed something called a Midnight Gardener, which is a big PVC tube that you could put your metals in and bury it in your backyard. Midnight Gardener. I thought it was cute. Yeah, that's a good name. <laughs> that's <laughs> interesting. I, I, be sure you remember where you put it, because I know the one the family, when their mother died, their grandmother died, they knew she buried some in the backyard, didn't know where it is. They had to dig up the whole backyard to find it. Yeah. There's, there's no so foolproof answer. Yeah. And, and, and maybe the point is diversify. Do different things. Do multiple things, possibly, you know. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That's always safe. But don't diversify like Wall Street says. Yeah. To diversify between this industry or that industry is simply putting everything in the same boat. Yeah. I agree with you there. Just in kind of wrapping up, tell people about your website and your newsletter and, and the book and so forth. And, uh, you know, any thoughts you have in closing? My website is roughtimes.com, www.roughtimes.com. There you'll learn more about me than you ever wanted to know. And I want to tell people that's spelled R-U-F-F Times. R-U-F-F Times, okay. that's correct. There you can read about me and sign up for my newsletter, The Rough Times, if you wish. But there's a, a, some benefits if you sign up for it. You get a free book, How to Prosper in the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century. Then I'll tell you how to rip me off if you want. Okay. If you, if you want to tell them, I'll let you. <laughs> sure. You would simply decide after a couple of newsletters that you don't want it. And so ask your money back, and I'll send it to you promptly, and you will keep the book. How's that? Sounds like a great deal. Any thoughts in closing, Howard? Well, just that uh, we're headed for trouble troubles, political troubles that, that are scary. I'm, I'm more frightened of for the future than I have been in all the years that I've been viewing with alarm. And so my concern is convincing all my children to do the right thing. Uh, I have a couple of two or three very wealthy uh, children. We have 14 children now, nine uh, that my wife bore, and uh, five teenagers we adopted, uh, and 76 grandchildren. So that's my biggest concern. And when I write, when I write the rough times, when I write books, I'm writing for my children, my family, really. I'm making sure that, that there's no Wall Street jargon and that people can understand what I'm saying and do what I suggest. And, that, and that it's a, really an instruction manual on how to do it. My key point is I've been publishing now for 34 years. I'm one of the old guys. I'm not one of these uh, slick guys with a hair slick back that goes on television to tell you what to do. A guy who's probably hardly old enough to get his driver's license to look like. And so the, uh, the upshot of it is if you want to let, hear from a, a savvy old guy who's been there, done that, been right most of the time over the years, then the rough times are where you want to go. And we've had over 600,000 subscribers over the years. And uh, my book, How to Prosper in the Human Bank Years, the biggest selling financial book in history, still is. And that was from the 1978 edition? Yeah, that was right? from the wow. 1978 edition. So when I realized that the Yogi Bear was right, it did all over again, and we were doing the same things we did in the 70s that caused that inflation that made us so much money in gold and silver. Rather than writing a new book, I just decided to revise the old one and update it. Good stuff. Well, Howard Ruff, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate having you on the show. and learning from your vast experience. It's been very insightful. Well, happy to talk to you. Call me again anytime you want. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.